everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm Patrick Wheeler. I'm the executive director for the Center for Digital Strategies. And we are really excited to welcome back to Tuck Bradley Webb, uh, a T16 and, and proud Tuck alum, and uh, who will be coming back in this sp later this spring as well for your reunion. Yep. Um, so we have a wide ranging conversation today. Bradley said some really interesting things, post Tuck in particular. Um, he is currently part of the core team building Surge AI into a natural language processing power with use cases from content moderation to artificial general intelligence. He's employee number four at Surge, and he leads growth and product as the company scales to meet a growing range of needs for some of the world's biggest technology platforms. Um, prior to working at Surge, Bradley was a senior product manager at Facebook and a staff product manager and product lead with Appfolio. He is a deep tech fellow at OnDeck, uh, a graduate of San Diego State University, and of course, Tuck. Bradley, welcome back. Thanks. It's, it's great to be back. So we, we could cover a lot of ground. Yes. We'll, we'll do our best and, and make sure that we have audience time for audience questions as well as we go. Um, I kind of want to start out with Surge. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about what Surge really is sure. um, and, and sort of what type of business that sure. they're in? So we'll start with a bit of a primer on AI and natural language processing just to kind of set the stage. Perfect. So um, we'll, we'll abstract a couple layers back and start with there are two primary components of AI, you have supervised and unsupervised learning, right? And unsupervised learning, you just feed a large, large model as much data as you can and hope that it learns the things that you want to learn in a generalizable way to do something else with. And then you have supervised machine learning, which is I see a picture of a cat, I call it a cat, the machine learns that a cat, so the next time it sees a cat, it knows that that's a cat. And so you have these two big components of AI in natural language processing, what you're finding is that there, there's this combination of both of those. Uh, Facebook, Google, OpenAI, uh, Microsoft are all working on these things called large language models that are courtesy of this technology called transformers. And so if you're not familiar with transformers, it's just this mechanism that is in place for machine learning to allow it to have this, this concept of short-term and long-term memory so that it can kind of compute like the human brain computes. But when you have these large language models, what you're doing is you're starting with a unsupervised, you're giving it all of the web and letting it consume all of the web. But then these large language models are basically like three-year-olds, right? And, and if you've ever interacted, I have a three-year-old. I have <laughs> eight-year-olds as well. But uh, if you've ever interacted with a three-year-old, they know a ton and know nothing all at the same time. And so the, the key to these large language models and the, the utility of these language models is then to be able to fine tune them into something more specific. And so one of the primary use cases that we see and actually probably one of the biggest opportunities in technology with regards to NLP is these, fi these large language models. If any of you have played with GPT-3 and their open API, that is a large language model that has been trained on all of the web. And you can get it to say some awful and horrible things. You can get it to say some really funny things. You can get it to draw pictures. You can get it to do all of these things. But they're all done at a relatively low level. Then you add a supervised layer on top of that to really fine tune it to get it to do something really interesting. So if you've heard of companies like uh, copy.ai. So copy.ai will write marketing copy for your company. Uh, and it actually does a really good job. And they talk about how they're built on GPT-3, but what the, that misses is that they're also built on their own models on top of GPT-3. Because it's not enough to just take the, this like wide open view of the web, you have to confine it to get the things that you want out of it. And that's where Surge comes in. So Surge uh, is a company that helps other companies build these really advanced language models, but also build these fine tuned components of those language models. So if you wanted to take the core large language model architecture that OpenAI has, and then train it to write software code, you would need software engineers to do that training, right? Like it wouldn't be enough to have like a three-year-old try to train a language model to write code. You need somebody who understands code to write code, but then also explain it, right? It's not enough to just write the code. The machine can already read code, right? Like it consumes billions of lines of code from, from GitHub all the time. It has to be trained to do those things. And, and so we have these software engineers, they'll write the code, then they'll explain why they made certain changes or 
you know, how they fixed a certain error, and that teaches the machine how to, to do these things. And so then you have things like Microsoft's Codex, which you can actually just use plain language and say, write me a function that does X or Y, and it'll do that. And that's the real power of the future of AI, is not that it's built behind closed doors by ML engineers and data engineers and data scientists, but that it's built by people like us who don't have you know, extensive linguistic backgrounds or math and science degrees, but that, who have a business problem that we need to solve and a way to explain that business problem in plain language. And that's the future of AI, and that's what our company enables, is that ability to train these models to do really fascinating and complex things um, by giving it really great data. And that really great data comes from people who understand the context. So, for example, one of our customers is Twitch. And if you've ever been on a tw Twitch stream, you'll know that the, the language is unique to the game, right? And so if you were trying to uh, train a model to identify abuse in a video game, that would look a lot different than abuse in uh, a text message or on Facebook or anywhere else. And so you need people who understand the coded language of video games because there are characters and there are references and there are nuances and all of that is things that we as people understand really well and that computers don't understand at all, right? Like, they, they just don't. And so in order to do that, you need people who understand that, who have that niche ability to, to apply their insights and their intelligence to the data so that the models can then encompass that data and provide really interesting and valuable predictions that move the business forward. So when you think about your business, right, why is it that surge is then needed? Are you providing those experts? Are you providing technology? You know, how, how do you fit really with this, this middle kind of layer of that, of that stack? So we're essentially a marketplace. Gotcha. So we have the companies who need data on one side, and we have people who are willing to provide that data. And you've seen this a lot in companies, if you've been following Silicon Valley in the news, like Scale. Scale AI, actually another Tuck alum works there. She was early at Scale. Um, and they focus on images, right? So if you're trying to build a self-driving car, you need images, you need to draw boxes around people and stop signs, et cetera. But for language, again, it, it's more difficult. For, for drawing boxes around cars, you need lots of people, but they don't have to be particularly uh, sophisticated people. You can train a three-year-old to actually draw a bounding box around a stop sign, right? Like that, that's a yeah. low context, low complexity task. For language, that's not the case, right? If you think about legal documents versus we had a customer who gave us <coughs> captured foreign military documents and asked us to identify all of the military equipment in those documents. A lay person is not going to be able to do that. And so we have to have this marketplace of talent that we can apply to these problems so that companies like Facebook or Twitter don't have to staff a million people to do these types of uh, things when they have these types of problems. So we allow for that effortless scal scalability that, that companies love, um, but that we can do because we exist across the entire ecosystem, right? We have dozens of customers that have needs for these 10 people, which means that we can keep them on our platform, keep them on our marketplace, whereas another company would have to pay them full time and get you know, 10 hours of work out of them. So most of your customers are are, are, you know, you've mentioned a few use cases. If you think about the, the like range of use cases, are most of your customers then relatively tech-savvy, sophisticated like tech companies? Or are you looking at other applications beyond that? Because there's a, there's a real difference in who you're dealing with as a customer and what you can do as a business, especially in tech and in spaces as complex as AI. So most of our customers, and we're a startup, so we're, you know, we're not in the thousands of customers range, right? Um, but most of our customers are companies that understand that there are very sophisticated things that they can do with AI and are pushing that envelope, right? If, if, you're, um, if you're just trying to build a vanilla model to do a vanilla thing to solve a vanilla problem, like we're, not, we're gonna be far too expensive for you. You can go find any of the other service providers to do that. We are gonna come with lots of expertise, but we're also gonna come with uh, a lot of technology because one of the other things that we do is that we're a marketplace, we have people, we have operations, so we're like a very dirty tech firm in that sense. We're not pure software, 
but we have our own software layer on top of that. Because one of the things that we find is where we have these experts, that expertise is generally constrained to a narrow use case, right? Like, so speaking to sophistication, the federal government would not be considered a fairly sophisticated technology customer, right? But they have very sophisticated experts, right? Like, if you think about looking at uh, foreign military uh, communication, like the stuff happening in Ukraine and Russia, right? A lot of that stuff is going to come down to analysts, individual analysts who speak certain languages, who understand the geopolitical situation. And frankly, there are probably not enough of those right now, given the volume of that. And so what we've done is we've built this platform that then takes advantage of machine learning that actively learns as these it's experts work time. and gets better to the point where we can start auto-labeling stuff that allows that expert to then focus on the hardest parts of that problem rather than having to do all 10,000, 100,000, 100 million labels themselves. How, how long, for, for given a use case like that or a similar one, how long does it take your, your, your systems and your technology to learn? Like, what, is that, what does that curve look like? It can be really fast or really slow, just depending on the complexity of the problem. So we've had um, models that we can bootstrap with like 1,000 samples which is, like, relatively speaking, you can do a 1,000 samples in, like, two or three hours, depending on sure. the complexity. Um, and others that required, like, 15,000. Like, one of the interesting ones in that case is um, profanity. So profanity is highly contextual, right? Like, if I said bad bitch, like, that could be a compliment, that could be a curse, that could be derogatory. Like, it really depends on the context, right? But most models... Uh, when it comes to profanity, are just profanity detectors, right? Like, if you were to yeah. type any sort of profanity into any social network, it would get flagged because they're just profanity detectors. So actually building a model that contextually understands profanity was actually com very complex, right? It took us, like, 15,000 examples for the model to actually be able to distinguish is this contextually bad profanity or contextually good profanity. And you know, given that language is not static, you know, something that can be positive today could be negative or vice versa. How do you, does your, how do you think about that in context of these models changing yep. over time as opposed to, okay, we've trained this model, now deploy it? Yeah, so model drift is a huge problem, not just for us, but for everyone, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Omicron, Delta, what did those mean 18 months ago? Not, right. I mean, not what they mean now, right? right. Um, and so... Not uh, an airline, Delta. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so the, um, the challenge with a lot of companies and with us is, is actually when do you need to relabel? And so again, like coming back to our roots, is we, we are an operationally intense business, but one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing and the reason we invest in our own ML is because it gives us a really interesting way to identify where model drift is happening because where the model and the humans start to disagree that, and disagree at... Uh, rates where it's not obvious, right? Like, humans make mistakes, right? Like, no matter how good you are, you're going to make small mistakes, especially if you're doing it at scale. But where those, those they disagree in non-obvious ways, where it wasn't a mistake, actually show us areas where there are maybe new nuances or new things that are, that are causing us to identify places where the models aren't doing as well to predict maybe this kind of slang or that uh, new problem, because the models are learning too. Like one of the things with uh, teaching a model to write code is that it actually gets harder to teach over time because the models get better, right? And so you actually have harder and harder work to do as the model gets better at doing those things. The problems aren't as easy. The model needs more sophisticated stuff to be able to solve. So that drift happens for both good and bad reasons, and it's something you absolutely have to monitor for sure. We've talked a little bit about kind of obviously how this works and sort of where the current state is for you. Where is this headed? I guess what do you, when you think about the future of NLP, when you think about where that, that horizon is, what are the things you're looking at, yeah. excited about? So, I mean, who knows what BERT is? LTSM. Okay, perfect. None of you need to know those <laughs> things, right? And, and, and like the, the reality of the future of NLP is that like, those, that terminology will be reserved for people like me who are like historians, right? Like um, AI is a very powerful tool, like I said, that I think will largely be 
confined to people writing in plain language to try to build models. Like, I don't think that the future, and, and granted, this is 10 or 15 or 20 years, but this is what Surge is trying to do. We don't think that the future is, is a world where you have ML engineers figuring out whether they should use uh, this transformer model or that transformer model and thinking about which type of like Google compute versus AWS compute versus you know, et cetera compute. It, it's really about the data, right? And so the, the future of AI is about giving a model, okay, I wanna predict X, here's 10 examples of what X looks like, here are 10 counter examples of what X looks like, and then the model gets spun up, right? And, and this sounds maybe futuristic, but like we've actually already had conversations with other companies about doing this, where their customers would write a sentence of what they want, and then the next day, courtesy of us, they would have a model waiting for them to do that thing. And so I think the reality of that abstraction layer, essentially an apps layer that sits on top of you know, the, the compute and the right. model architecture, but that still requires that data piece, I think that's the future of where ML is going because it makes it accessible to the people at the business level who need to make business decisions to enable business outcomes. Uh, and that's, been a, that's, that's actually a really hard problem, right? Like if you talk to an ML engineer or a data scientist, getting them to understand the business implications of why they're doing what and, and how this matters, or even to experiment with something very small, like that's one of the primary use cases that we see is lots of experimentation, right? Can we even create a model that writes code, right? Like, that's the first thing that we're going to do. And you, you might, as a, as a business manager, want to know that and to try that, but spinning up a ML engineer and a data scientist and the ops team to do all this stuff is very expensive. If you can just, you know, overnight get that, then suddenly that gives you a ton of experiment capabilities and a ton of ability to solve problems at the business level that you couldn't otherwise. Very similar to the, the, the general development of no-code kind of development progression and moving forward. And, and you and I have had a lot of conversations around the power of no code, yep. kind of a low code, no code kind of platforms Absolutely. as well. Yep. Um, it, it sort of, in some ways, it's almost counterintuitive for some of the advice that gets told to MBA audiences like this, which is learn how to code, right? And, yeah. and sort of learn how to understand that. But, but don't learn be, how to code. Don't learn how to code. Write yeah. SQL, that's fine, SQL. but don't, yeah. don't learn how to code. We'll get to the, all that advice as well. But uh, yeah, so um, so can you talk about some of the interesting things? You, you've had an interesting year, um, whether it's you know thinking about a, some of the some of the work with OpenAI, Super Bowl, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit some of the interesting things you've you've been working on yep. um, in the last year or so? Yeah. So um, Surge has been around for about eighteen months, um, and so we've we've gone through kind of um, this maturation in a, at a relatively like high speed. And a lot of that is courtesy of the fact that like our founding team, myself, Andrew, our head of engineering, and Edwin, our CEO, ha all have deep expertise in this space, right? And so that has allowed us to kind of deploy that expertise with customers. And, and that's like been one of the things that I've found very interesting is that customers look to us for advice. They're like, hey, how should we do this, right? And that, you know, like that was actually really surprising to me to hear like, researchers at OpenAI asking us questions about like how, like, you know, these are the smartest people in the world, right? Um, um, but so that allows us to kind of push our customers to do interesting things, right? Like one of the interesting things that we found is that uh, a lot of people come to us and they're like, oh, well, we want to get this data and we're going to get it reviewed by three people, right? Um, and they do that because, okay, well, if I get three people, then I'll get a tie break and um, you know, we'll know we have the right. Um, but imagine a situation where you have one person who's an expert in, a, in a, a field, right? Who knows and understands the nuance, and you have two people that aren't, right? And if they you see something, overrule, right? and they yeah. overrule the person that is the expert, right? And so we believe in this very deep, deep expertise, right? Like that's what our, our marketplace is built on having people and applying them to the problem that have expertise. And so what's been really interesting, I think, is in having these conversations with customers and like educating them that, no, you actually don't need three people to solve this. And that creates for some like very interesting sales conversations. I mean, I'm a product person, and I've spent absolutely zero t bit of time on product in the last year because everything is sales and marketing, right? Um, but it creates these really interesting conversations with customers because they're like, oh, well, this, co this company is you know, four times cheaper. 
but they also require five times as much data, right? And so having these insights and, and doing this education is actually a really interesting uh, challenge because the, the segment as a whole has kind of been accustomed to this idea, well, we'll just get lots of data, right? Like right. lots and lots and lots of data. And what we're finding and what we're showing is that actually what you don't want is lots of data. You want good data, right? And sometimes that means getting a lot less of it and paying a lot for it but getting less data from the experts rather than getting a bunch of like consensus vote that might be wrong, might be right, and that you won't have an idea. Like we were working with Twitch and they were building a model to identify um, hate speech. And one of the things that they, it wasn't hate speech, it was toxicity or bullying or something like that. One of the things that they found was their model wasn't good enough for the data we delivered to them. We delivered such high quality data that their model wasn't capable in its current architecture and state to take advantage of that. So they had to rebuild the model to take advantage of the data that we delivered to them. Is, now, it, so it's, it, what this, a lot of this, this tells me is that development process for, for business development side, you may be moving into new areas constantly and requiring experts. How do you find, like what's the, to me the, the, the sort of choke point almost seems like it could be, be how do we get these experts to work with us, if it's gamers on Twitch, how do we bring them into this, this business? And they're so critical to yep. your success. How do you think about that problem and solving it? So, it's, so I have the same conversation with our CEO all the time um, because we haven't really built um, a muscle around that, right? To, uh, I think like when we think of other big marketplaces like Uber and, and Airbnb, like one of the things that those marketplaces are known for is their ability to operationalize new segments, right? Like Uber was known for opening new cities, right? And same with Airbnb, they were known for how they could open new cities. cities. Um, one of the things that we found is that that crunch, I think, hasn't been as acute for us. And so we haven't really actually had to invest. Sure. Like we've been able to kind of like bootstrap it. And like one of those things where you just do it manually until that doesn't work anymore. Um, and we haven't gotten to a scale yet. E even though we're delivering millions of labels a month, like we haven't gotten to a scale yet where um, we haven't been able to just bootstrap that, that component. We, we've, we're probably at the, the inflection point for some of our um, coding work because um, we are seeing a lot of demand. Uh, so we, ha we just got a new customer that they want um, to teach a, like a a chatbot, how to, to do, um, uh, like use a library, matplotlib library. If anybody's done coding, like matplotlib is the worst library ever. And so they want to teach this chatbot to do that. And so we're getting to the point where we're probably running into scale problems there, but the, the rest of our platform, again, because of the investments in software to enable labeling and, and just kind of the types of customers we have, we haven't had too much of a scale operational problem there. You mentioned um, you've been doing a lot of selling. You're, you know, I think you're head of product and growth. What does that mean? Like when you, you know, for a lot of folks are interested uh, from the MBA program, like going into smaller and smaller companies, obviously scale is quite small at this point. You're employee number four. What does head of growth and product mean in, in general and from, at a company like Surge? Um. <laughs> it's startups, right? So yeah. it means so, everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. I think the, you learn a lot in your MBA that is super relevant to the task. Um, and so I think this role is probably the role that I've most leaned on the things that I learned here to actually like go out and, and use. Um, because it, it does rely so much on, you know, I, I think back to this class that I took, um, I don't remember the name of it, but they talk about cultural artifacts, right? And I, I'm constantly thinking about that as we're like trying to build the culture of our firm. And, and I'm doing hiring, I do a ton of hiring. And so like I spend a ton of time like focus on, you know, like growing our team itself, right? Uh, and thinking about how do, we, how do we think about hiring people? And, and this is one of those things I, I think to pause and talk about really quickly. The advice is always, you know, hire the best people. Um, but that's actually a, a really interesting advice because like we're in this situation now where you know we have people that I think would be good at the job. And if we don't hire them, right, like we're a startup. We don't get thousands of applications 
a day, right, like Facebook does. Like at Facebook, I could turn down everyone, right, because I know that the next day my queue would be full of more people that I could interview, right? But I have this candidate who's like, it's fine. And if I turn him down, then is it another three or six or nine months before I hire somebody to fill that role? And he might do a fine job, and he might not do a fine job, yeah. and I, I don't know. And not hiring him will mean that I have to do that job. As well as find someone. To as do well that as job. find someone and yeah. do all the other jobs. And so there, there are these really interesting problems that I think startups present to you that, are, uh, that force you to kind of like push through some of those platitudes and, and like truisms that you hear and actually like think and execute on like real hard decisions, right? Like do we hire somebody knowing that we may have to fire them in two weeks or four weeks or six weeks? And that's super uncomfortable, right? Like we just hired you and you're not doing a good enough job and I'm gonna fire you and you probably made a bunch of life changes and you told all your friends and like that's really uncomfortable, right? Like you might have a child coming, like very, very uncomfortable things to have to do. Um, and so I think the, the grounding from MBA has been most practical there. I mean, working at products at big companies, you have a, you have a job, right? And, and your job is to make sure that the product get launched, but there are so many specialists around you that you can rely on for their expertise, right? You have the product marketers, you have the sales team, you have the engineers, you have the QA team. Um, but in a startup, that's all you, and so you really have to like le reach back and, and pull those things in. Um, but I think in more abstract terms, a lot of what I'm doing from a product point of view is trying to look um, further down the road. So um, our engineers, right, like at a startup, your engineers are gonna be very capable, right? And like they're gonna be in the weeds, they're gonna know what they should build. And so the, the question is, is like, what actually do we build six months from now? What investments do we need to be making now that are going to pay off without over-investing, right? Like, you know, we, had this talk internally, like should we invest in new uh, onboarding, right? Like onboarding new people on the, the, the supply side. Um, that's an investment we could make, but is that an overinvestment, right? And on the growth side, it's really about taking all those lessons of like, what are all the distribution channels? How do I effectively attack all those distribution channels? How do I set up experiments across these to understand the value. What is the value of a customer? What's the, the customer acquisition cost? How do I think about those things in a framework that makes sense for a startup? Um, how do I think about those things in the framework that makes sense for we just need to move fast, right? Some, like, I will hear our CEO say more often than not, I don't care about the money, right? Which is, it, like, it's a great thing to hear, but they're all, they're, <laughs> there's this pernicious other side to that. It was like, we do actually care about the money. Like, we, act, we, we need to make money, and so there are only so many bets where we can take where we just, like, don't care about the money, right? right? Uh, and so how do we, like, thread that needle of, like, you know, taking bets, moving fast, like, all of the, these, like, Silicon Valley truisms that you hear that you want to emulate, um, but that there are, like, absolute limitations on. So in the last you know, six years since leaving Tuck, can you talk a little bit about your journey of what, you know, you're, we've talked a lot about where you're at now. Can you talk a little bit about your journey? I know right out, you know, you were an intern at Facebook and went back full time. Can you talk a little bit about that and then sort of how that progressed? Yeah, so um, when I was at Facebook originally, there were 8,000 employees. And when I left Facebook, there were 64,000 employees. Um, so. And we're not talking over 10 years. No, we're talking three, three and, and, a and a half years. years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, the business doubled every year. It was crazy. Um, but that also meant that there was just tons of space and opportunity to learn. But it also, um, Facebook has a performance culture like unlike any place I've ever seen. Um, the expectations are exceedingly high and everyone feels an obligation to meet and exceed those expectations. I mean, if you want to be surrounded by all the type A people, right? Like <laughs> Facebook is the place you go and you feel like you're constantly competing and it's thrilling. Um, but it is also doing all of the interesting things. And that's where I got to learn all of this stuff about AI. When I was, actually when I was at Tuck, um, I spent a lot of time working on AI projects uh, and just like technology projects while I was here. I took, I forget the name of the class. I should have written this down. But I took a class 
And one of the things I did in that class was I built a, a model to predict the outcome of the Democratic primary using Twitter and a bunch of other like um, uh, factors to try, to try to predict primary outcomes. And that was really where I got into that. And then Facebook allowed me to like lean more into that and, and really solve problems. And, and the interesting thing about Facebook is that just the scale that it operates at means that everything can be an AI problem. Um, the, the scope of the product I owned was when you report a bug. Um, so if you have Facebook on your phone and you shake Facebook really hard, or you shake the, your phone really hard, a thing will pop up and it'll ask you if you want to report a bug. I built that. Um, and the reason we built that was not because we wanted you to um, get annoyed and shake your phone, but was actually because we had built a bunch of AI um, into the system and we needed more bug reports. So we're getting about 300,000 bug reports a day. But as with everything, it kind of revolved around this like 80-20 rule, where 80% of the bug reports were about 20% of the problems, and 20% of the problems that we knew about, right? But we had these, this really, really, really long tail of problems, and we wanted to learn more about those problems, and we built some really sophisticated systems to help us understand, but we needed more samples in that tail, right? And we needed, you know, we had like 10 samples or 20 samples, and we needed 100. And so we figured, how could we increase the number of bug reports from 300,000 a day to 2 million a day? And that was, and, and what that allowed us to do was like increase the number of bug reports, which meant that statistically there were going to be more samples because we, you know, 10x the number of reports a day in that tail that would allow all of that AI we built around identification to actually be effective and allow us to solve really pernicious problems that were really hard to uncover, right? Like if you were on this like new, this like edge case phone in on a certain type of network in a certain location, right? There are only a few people that meet that criteria, but we could get more of them to report and, I, and identify it and actually get to solve those problems. Whereas like newsfeed not loading, we weren't gonna solve, right? Like there are just too many times that newsfeed loads in a day, like, it, like there are too many problems causing that, but these things we could actually solve. And so that was where I really got into like, the deep bowels of AI and understanding supervision versus unsupervised and like how do you operationalize human review and labeling. Um, and then for family reasons, we just decided to move to San Diego, um, my wife and our kids. And so I left Facebook. This was before the pandemic and before work remotely was a thing. <laughs> um, and I started at this company called Atfolio. They're a real estate tech company. Um, they, um, and, and I eventually became the, the head of our um, mid-market business unit. So it was an $80 million a year business unit selling to kind of like that, that bulge of mid-market property managers. Um, and that was a really interesting opportunity because it was so different from Facebook, right. right? Like the scale was just so much different. And even just the approach, right? The, the company was founded in Santa Barbara. And, and so it was very different like culturally. But also one of the things that I realized was that being separate from these centers of excellence, if you call them, the Valley, New York City, LA, I guess, um, it has an effect on the type of company that you can build because being in those big areas means that people are moving around between those companies and they're constantly bringing these new ideas across these companies. And if you're always only recycling between five or six or seven tech companies because you're in this small location, the, the robustness of that innovation culture just isn't as um, just dynamic, which is also then really interesting when we think about what remote has done. Right, because that allows people to shift and move all the more, right? While still having these like innovation centers in Silicon Valley, in New York City, in LA, um, and that really allows it to push the envelope. But it's also where we had to think a lot more about business, right? Like Facebook, the product sells itself, right? Um, but at Afolio, we actually had competitors, and we were in a market that wasn't growing as fast as it should be, right? Like if you think about startups, what makes a startup a startup is that it grows really fast, right? Like expectations are 20, 30, 50% year over year. That the housing market in the United States is growing between two and 5% year over year, which means that like there's a limit, there's a literal limit to how fast we can grow without having to run up against our competitors. And so then it becomes this like takeaway battle, 
right, which is very different from Facebook. Facebook is kind of this wide open, you know, there weren't a lot of competitors and where they were, we would buy them and we would copy them or, you know, we would do those things because there, was, there wasn't the same limit on people's attention, right? But where in this B2B world, there was this absolute limit. There's, there's a upper limit on the amount and so it was a lot about marketing and positioning and packaging and pricing and things that were totally foreign to me at Facebook suddenly became this like really important thing that we had to think through of like, okay, should we build this thing because we don't have unlimited resources? We're not Facebook, we can't just throw engineers at every problem. How do we think about which problem is the most important problem? Will people pay for this, right? Like this, this idea that like, if you build it, they'll pay for it is totally broken, right? And asking people whether they'll pay for it is also totally broken. They won't tell you whether they'll pay for something. Or they will, but they will be lying. Yeah. Like people always lie to you, never trust anyone in an interview, they will always <laughs> lie to you. I'm serious. A piece of advice. Yeah, right. read, read The Mom Test, it's like a short book, but it's great because it really focuses on the fact that like, you basically can't trust people to tell you the truth because they want you to like what they tell you, Yeah. right? And so how do you invent ways to figure out if people are actually going to pay for something, right? Not will they tell you they'll pay for something, but will they actually pay for it and how much are they gonna actually pay for it? Um, and so that was like a great, kind of primer before moving into Surge because I got a lot more of this experience with like how do you build a business, not how do you build products. It, it's, it's, it seems also depending on the type of your business you're in, you can or can't go to market and test, right? I mean, I think one of the, one of the other challenges that a, that a real estate company has is getting this wrong has significant financial implications for you, right? Whereas if you're doing something in a space that has much smaller transaction dollar amounts you can test and sort of tweak as you go and iterate and much more which is sort of the silicon valley ethos in general is yeah. this idea that well let's let's get this out there and test and, yeah and um, sales cycles are something that um, a lot of the the start of advice is couched in terms of consumer companies yes right and consumer companies have a sales cycle of a day right like i come to you with an app i'm like hey look at this cool app and you're like oh that sounds cool i'll download it right and then you get into their growth funnel and all of that is taken care of. But if you're a business, you have needs, and I'm gonna come to you and I'll be like, I can solve your needs. And they're like, great, let's set up a calendar invite to talk next week. And so then we come back and we talk next week and then they're like, oh, well, let me bring in John because John needs to know and Patty needs to know. And so we have this other meeting with them. And, and it's this very long, and so the ability to experiment is much diminished. So you have to think a lot more creatively about how can you experiment in those environments, and it's great if you're already at an established like B2B business because you have the existing ecosystem that you can sit on top of, right? So like, you know, Appfolio had thousands of customers, so we could experiment with things within that ecosystem. Um, but it, it, it's always, it's a much bigger challenge and it, it's a little bit more interesting, I think. The other piece that we haven't talked about about this journey is on deck. Can you talk about what on deck is and what your experience has been? I think, have, have folks in the room heard of On Deck before? How many have heard of it? One. One. Two. Cool. Um, okay. About what I would expect okay. at an MBA on. So um, On Deck is a cohort-based uh, community. Um, and it's actually aimed at disrupting exactly this, right? Like <laughs> elite MBA programs. Uh, the people in my cohort literally were choosing between going to Stanford or Harvard and doing On Deck, right? So it, it's like squarely targeted at this audience. Um, and it's for people who want to found companies or work in uh, tech in a lot of different ways. There are a bunch, I mean, OnDeck is iterating with go-to-market in a lot of different ways. So they have hundreds, it feels like hundreds of cohorts across a lot of different functions, like chief of staff and product and operations and sales. And, um, but their core fellowship is the founder's fellowship and it's, uh, I was in the third cohort several years ago. They're on their 15th or 17th cohort now. And what that is, is it like, it's basically this Slack community of founders who are at varying degrees or varying stages of their founder's journey that uh, we can lean on, right? Like I, we, I was trying to figure out what the compensation for a lead product marketing manager should be. I had no idea, I've never hired a product. If, if you ask me what an engineer should be paid or PM should be paid, I got you. But I had no idea what a PM, and I had no idea what a salesperson should be paid. And by the way, if you wanna make a lot of money, tech sales is the place to be, trust me. 
Um, <laughs> you will make more than engineers. But, um, but so it was a place where I could go ask those questions. We were trying to figure out benefits, right? And like, I don't know, how many of you have set up benefits for your company, right? Like, how many of you set up payroll? Like, these are things that you do in companies that you've, you'll never have done before and you might not do again. We did it three times because we weren't happy with our payroll provider. Um, but these are like lessons that you learn from people that are in varying kind of stages of that development process. Um, and so I found it like extremely vital to our like Surge's ability to kind of evolve at, a, uh, at the pace it has, also without kind of that VC investment. So we're bootstrapped. We haven't taken any VC money. And a lot of this kind of has traditionally come from VC, but there's a cost to that, right? Like you're gonna give up 20% of your company to get that upside, and, and it, it's only gonna be two or three people, and they may have bad advice, right? Like I've talked to a lot of VCs. Their expertise isn't necessarily benefits. No, and, and, and frankly, I've talked to, like, you know, we, we've kind of gone on the have discussions with all of the VCs because, you know, they're interested in we can. And, and I'll be honest, like when I first started, I'm like, oh, VCs are probably super smart. They're not, they're not, they're not, they're not any smarter than you guys are, right? They, they're not any different than the normal people, right? Like the folks at Sequoia were, were smart and the fo folks at Benchmark were really smart, but like the average VC is no different than anyone else, right? And so then having this cohort of thousands of people, right, that, that can help answer questions and really kind of escort you through that process at very stage and that you can then give back to with answers that when somebody else is looking at like, oh, what did you guys think of JustWorks or Gusto, right? We can provide that feedback. Um, and so I think the, the TLDR on all of that is that these communities are very valuable. So this community here is super valuable, but you'll find that there are other communities that are gonna be really valuable to your growth and your career, whether it's specific to your function or specific to your segment. Those, those communities are extremely valuable. Uh, and I would say that you can't ever underinvest in community uh, because they will have huge returns to the investment. Good way to segue into our community. Questions, what do people have, qu what questions do people have for Bradley? Yeah, Kakira. Um, you said at uh, some point, uh, AI companies can grow over time, grow uh, over maybe number of use cases. So, I would assume it would be hard to you know, find if a company works or not if, if the company is in the early stage. So I'm very curious to know, um, you know your perspective on search before you join. Um, how, how would you know that it would work? Or any advice for us? Um, <laughs> how do you find a yeah, company that actually works? How to take that leap? <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, gosh, AI companies are usually charlatans. Um, <laughs> That's a good question. So um, I actually met Edwin, our founder, through On Deck. Another plug for that. Um, and and so, the uh, like I think the other thing is, is I wasn't actually looking for a new job at the time, right? Like he met, we met because he had questions about um, AI operations and growth, and I could answer them, right? And so, you know, we spent a couple months kind of interacting and engaging and working together and kind of just like trialing something essentially um, unofficially for a while before I actually decided to like join the business. So I had like a lot more visibility into that. But the other thing I would say is that like um, you should ask hard questions, right? Like put on that VC hat and be like, okay, so what's your revenue? What's your go to market? Like what is your, ex like, and, and the other thing I'll say is like going back to our customers looking at, at us as the experts, right? Like Edwin, our CEO, worked at YouTube and Dropbox and built the original uh, open door buying algorithm and worked at Facebook. And Andrew, our head of engineering, was responsible for combating like Russian interference at Twitter. And I worked at Facebook. Like they trust us, right? Your the person founding that company, you had better trust is an expert because like people will see through that. Right, and so that like expertise of like founding a company because it's something you know deeply, I think is very important. I think there's been um, a lot of like traction for people just starting companies based on good ideas, and good ideas are worth zero dollars, right? Like execution and distribution are the most important things, and the only way you get those things is with deep expertise in that problem, 
or by taking a ton of VC money and diluting yourself out and like learning as you go, right? And so like if you want to start a startup, put on that hat of like would I invest a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred because that's what you're doing, right? Like you're getting this early equity that is worth zero dollars and you're investing it in this founder, hoping that it gets to be more valuable. And so you, you need to really think about that and ask those hard questions and um, and like not drink the Kool-Aid, right? Like if you guys are paying attention to the fast thing, right? Like, you know, they raised a hundred and some odd million dollars. They grew from a hundred to five hundred in a year. Like there, there are certainly red flags, right? Uh, and, and you really need to like think as a, because like all of those people, all of the things they could have been doing for that time it is, is now like up in smoke, right? There's plenty of good examples where we go to Theranos and yep. we work and others that have been down this path. I think one of the things we've, we, uh, to echo that, you know, when we talk to founders, you know, I think David Kunzel a few years ago came up from the CEO and founder of Drift, and he said that very much the same thing. There are those that start with an idea and those that start with solving a problem, and, and he favors the latter and says that most of the people with an idea, you have to be incredibly lucky to get that right. Uh, Jean. Um, I'm curious, I'm going to get to the NLP space, but I can see the query space is for something like the person's idea. Where do you think NLP, maybe machine learning, is still really learning? Um, I think you can, it's, you can tell we've been doing a lot of interviewing yeah, lately because yeah. the questions are nice. And yeah, <laughs> I I think it's underutilized in that a lot of people don't realize that things are language problems. Um, so if you think about uh, building a model to write code, right? Like that may not like intuitively be a, like oh this is a language problem, but it is a language problem or um, Trying to uh, interpret intent, right? Like, um, certainly, like, is this like bad content or not bad content? Is like a very naive version of like interpreting intent. But there's a lot more of the like um, when we give a command, right? Like, uh, if you were to say, "Get me a bottle of water," right? Like, there's a lot of intent that's wrapped up in that very simple command. Right? So teasing out, like I think all of that, there are big opportunities there for robotics and medicine because there's a lot wrapped into these very simple commands, right? Like my wife works in abdominal transplant, right? And there's like very simple things that she says that having been married to her for a long time now, I, like I understand what that means, right? But like there's so much context wrapped up in that. So I think places where there's lots of embedded in intent Right in in these commands, I think there 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 are lots of places where that's underutilized for sure. Thank you. How does search deal with bias? You mentioned bias. Uh, you mean like um, in the models, but because you're using people to to rank things, right? to label things. Yeah. How do you deal with the bias of people? So one of the things that we uh, do is we have like expert reviewers. So auditors, so <clears throat> we audit a percent of every project. And that's uh, it's kind of like an inverse uh, exponential. So uh, at the beginning of a project, we'll audit lots of it, right? We'll have experts in the, like, so we'll have the project done, and then we'll have you know, somebody edit, may, audit maybe 50% of it, right? Over time, as that project goes on and becomes productionalized, it'll maybe descend down to like 2%. But that audit helps us kind of like monitor for those types of things. The other thing we do is like where those types of biases are pernicious and problematic, right? Like, uh, like everybody's kind of heard the stories of the sentencing algorithms that like do all sorts of things to like reinforce problems. Uh, we actually have demographics of our workforce. So we work with some of our customers for where, where they're doing these like particularly sensitive things to help them build a demographically representative sample. Um, we've even had customers ask if we can like niche down into like very, very like narrow demographics because they're doing something very sensitive across like the entire US population. So they wanted like little pockets all over. Um, so it, it really depends on, not every application suffers from this, the same like 
penalties of bias, right? Like there is always going to be bias, but in some cases it, it's like not that relevant. Um, or the bias is actually like good because it biases you towards maybe more caution or more uh, aggression depending on like what is necessary. Um, but where it is like dangerous, we absolutely have mechanisms to kind of observe for that because it is a real problem. And it's, it, to, me, that's, to me, that seems also the, the use of experts is to inject the kind of bias you want to see in the model. It seems as part of that benefit of having experts totally. doing some of that moderation yep. and model building. Yeah, in the back. So one thing that I'm uh, seeing in your talk is the importance of data. And I'm curious to know if there's anything that you can talk about search AI and how you can improve the quality of data that you're using for, for your models. So I think the biggest thing in this space is that you need to be thinking about the data you're going to need in the future now <clears throat> because you can't retroactively collect that data. I was having a conversation with the CTO of this company and was talking about his AI strategy, but what he was failing to, to like actually grasp was that he wasn't actually collecting the data he needed to be collecting now to implement that AI strategy. Right? Like the, that AI strategy is bound to fail because they were overlooking the fact that they weren't collecting that data that they were going to need. So a lot of it has to do with just like being really like thoughtful about the stuff that you're collecting. And this is where places like Facebook do like really well, right? Like they realize that it's really cheap to collect it, so they're just gonna collect all of it uh, and, and then piece it together in different ways to like make insights from it. Um, but you really have to be thinking about it in advance and, and you know, having most of us been from Facebook, we ha kind of have that built into kind of our DNA, but most companies do not. Like most companies don't realize that like I can't retroactively get the last six years worth of data, and now I'm gonna have to wait six months to be able to do this thing because I didn't, haven't been collecting Depending any. Depending on the cycle data. times could be years, right? Right, right. Yeah. It, it is a really interesting sort of challenge. I think there's a, there's a lot of wisdom for, for those of you that are going out to work in organizations to push to, leaders that you're working with to think about where could we use these tools in the future and therefore what data do we need to think about cataloging and, and, and kind of organizing. Yep. Yeah. I, uh, I'm Surge's data privacy officer, so. Ah, um, I did not know that. No, it's because there's only four of us. So. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'm also our HIPAA compliance kind officer of as well. Hand out the. Um, <laughs> it, so it, uh, it's very onerous, uh, actually, to comply with the kind of the data privacy standards. As a, like, I think an early stage startup, we have committed to, like, it's probably easier for us to do it now than it will be for us to do it a year or two from now. So we're taking on, GDPR compliance and HIPAA compliance now so that we can essentially access those customers and not have to worry about like trying to build it in later. Um, but I have actually seen companies do very weird things with these rules. Um, so at my last company, um, only PMs were allowed to see customer data. Which, it's interesting. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting decision. So, like, none of our engineers, right? Like, none of our engineers could access. So, like, if they had to debug, like, I was then the choke point, right, of debugging something on a customer's like instance, yeah. which is like a really interesting problem, right? Because now, like, my time is super precious, but so is their time. And like, if I'm not, if I don't make myself available, then suddenly this bug is now going to persist, right? And so. Companies can make really bad decisions of, in the interest of privacy um, that have like real effects on their ability to deliver an outcome to their customers. Uh, and so it, it does require a lot of in, like, thoughtfulness in how you Im implement those data privacy things. Uh, it, like, for us, it hasn't been particularly invasive because we are still so small. We have 10, 12 employees. Um, so it's relatively easy for us to manage. 
as we grow, I'm sure we'll have to think more thoughtfully about it. But again, as like a data and AI company, it, like this will be front of mind to us. As for other companies, it's, it's just not going to be. So one last question. Vish, go ahead. Um, so you were talking briefly about the golden market strategy. So at, some, at this stage, how have you thought about where you landed on your go-to market? And what things do you keep in mind as you think about which industries or areas you want to experiment in? So, haven't landed, I think, on a go-to-market. We have experimented with channels, and we've seen some productivity in those channels, and so that's leading us to make investments in those to see if we can maintain that productivity, right? So, um, our CEO is a, is a great writer. Um, before he started Surge, he had a blog that had hundreds of thousands of followers. So he's, he's a very good writer, very engaging, very interesting. So one of our strategies is actually he'll, every couple weeks, he'll write an article that's really interesting for a variety of reasons, and we'll post it on Hacker News, and usually it'll get to the front page of Hacker News, and that will drive some lead volume, right? Like, we had a, com we had a conversation with a prospect, <clears throat> and they didn't come to us because of that, but like one of the things they said in the, the call was, oh, hey, like, We've seen your articles. They're really interesting. They're really engaging. They're really thoughtful. They're really on point, right? And so that's a place where, OK, our CEO has a limited amount of time. There's only so much of that he can do. How can we invest in that to see if we can re re retain some of the pro productivity of that channel? Um, and like, what's the right investment size? So like the last two weeks, I've been working with some other folks on our team to like actually document all of our content all of our contacts with prospective customers and actual customers so that we have like an actual funnel so we can be like, okay, back to the envelope math, we can spend $8,000 per whatever, and so that's our investment size. And so we'll spend $8,000 and see what we get out of that, and then we can toggle from there. And so that's how we've been kind of taking it. And so then it's just make a list of all the different channels and all the different experiments we can run and do something little there to see if we can like get a channel working and then if we can, pour money into it at a certain like pace to see if it remains productive. But it's hard because there's also this very lossy um, attribution between the work we do and when somebody actually signs. And lots of different things can contribute to that because it's an enterprise sale, right? Like we're selling to companies that are gonna be spending hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on this stuff. And so it could be that, you know, they're VP of engineering read one article and their, you know, eng director saw something else and their IC data science manage, you know, data scientist saw something else and all of that contributed to the success getting there. So it, it's not as like attributable as consumer, right? Where where it, it's a lot like closer together in terms of like see something, take action. Enterprise is longer and it's, it's less attributable. And we have like just the relationship component of it, right? Like Edwin and I and Andrew and the other folks on our team know people in the industry because we've been in the industry. So we can reach out and talk to people. We can follow up. Um, and so it, it's really messy. Um, and it's something that we're constantly thinking about and focused on and playing around with. Bradley, thank you. Little fun fact, when, when we first met, when you were in your first year of Tuck, Bradley started Tuck with brand new twins who are now eight. Yes. Um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a lot of sleepless nights going through your first year, I remember, at Tuck, and a lot of good conversations we had. This was a wonderful conversation for us. I think covered a ton of ground. NLP is a really interesting space. The, the work that you've been doing and the work through your career has been really fascinating. We look forward to seeing what's next. But you know, on behalf of Tuck and the center and Professor Taylor, faculty director, Carolyn up there, um, we just want to say thank you for spending this time with us and helping our students learn a little bit more about what you do and, and what your journey has been. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. <laughs>